Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with LA-based jazz drummer, band leader, and educator, Dean Musetti. We discussed at length his new and debut 2023 CD called Isolation Integration with his Rhythm Real Band. Like most young musicians setting out to learn their craft, Dean has plans to earn a living playing the music. But little did he know that he would become a full-time music educator and a mentor to many young people who may not have had access to a music education otherwise. This album compresses six songs constructed collectively by the band with Dean at the helm. He formed the band back in August of 2015 as a type of workshop ensemble in order to create a way for a couple of his former middle school students to gain playing experience after graduating. He has a fascinating story. We get into his love of jazz, playing, teaching, recording, and so much more. Dig this story. Hey, Dean, what's up, man? Nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. This is an honor and a pleasure. Oh, man, same here. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for being a part of this. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to delving into your life. So thank you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a super fan, so the, I, I want to interview you, Joe, so I'm here to interview you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it. I am always open to interpretation. Before we get into your latest album and your life and music, I want to kind of, think, like right now we're looking at March of 2023, and I think there's a level of PTSD because in 2020 everything just melted away. And I'm curious, how did you survive that three-year period now that you have new music, live music coming back into being. How did you get through it? How has it changed the way that you approach things now? Yeah, you know, I, I, we were, the band was in, we rehearsed uh, every week, twice a week, our rhythm section does. And, and we were talking on a couple of days ago, I'd like going like, wow, it was three years ago that uh, the closure, you know, happened. And we had played a gig like the night before, the closure and I, you know, I t- teaching. I teach at a middle school full time, and and I think we played the gig on a Sunday and the Friday before, two days before that, uh, the school announced that we were we were closing for a couple weeks um, to see how things were to play out, and then um, it became clear that we weren't going back. And uh, as a middle school music teacher, I then had to um, readjust. We started teaching online immediately, and I had to figure out in that spring semester, with just a couple months left in the school year, how I was going to teach a music class and what I was going to do, and we were all trying to figure out uh, how to make that work. And then the following year, um, going to teaching completely online. So I, I had a school day, Monday through Friday, throughout throughout that height of the pandemic and, and teaching from home and teaching on a laptop and, you know, teaching up to 120 students, you know, throughout the day and figuring out a music curriculum and um, trying to figure out how, how to do it. And it was, you know, a real stressful time, I think for educators. And then um, on the musician side of my life and the band leader side of my life and the drummer side of my life, um, I looked at the band, and and the band was primarily a, a live performing band. You know, the band was designed to be a live performance. I never had the intent of recording. It was it was about. Um, I started the band uh, with with uh, the intent of keeping some former middle school students of mine playing after high school. So I formed the band around them, and and to get uh, for us all to get experience playing live together. Um, and when that closed during the pandemic, um, I trying to make a way out of what seemed like there, there wasn't any way at the time and, um, turned the focus. Well, if we can't play live, let's, let's focus on, on the recording. Let's, let's, let's see if we can make an album during all this. So, uh, in addition to teaching music online at the middle school, uh, we would still, rehearsed once a week in our guitarist Dory Wallace's backyard. We moved from the rehearsal space that we, because we didn't want to be inside. So he has a house here in the North uh, West Valley, uh, San Fernando Valley. Um, and we rehearsed uh, once a week, every Sunday outside away from each other. And we did that for about a year and a half until it was the post vaccinated um, situation 
and then we started getting back in the rehearsal room together. And in that time, we were developing material, more more t- type of original material, uh, things that were different than what we were playing previously, um, and developed the material for the album over the time outside in the backyard, and then we moved back into the rehearsal space. And, and, and that was my, you know, my existence through that, through the pandemic, was... Uh, teaching middle school music online and and working still trying to work with the band in 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 whatever way possible. So the name of the new album is Isolate Integrate. What a perfect name! And it has to feel good, based on what you explained how you came to this album. Just to feel like you you got an album out. We're we're heading into the warm months that we're officially heading into post pandemic. This has to feel good. Uh, it does, you know, I mean, that, this was the, the trajectory that we had set, uh, was to, you know, create a work, um, that, that we could record, create pieces of music that we could record and, and put out. And that was the focus, you know, like I explained when we couldn't play live and to have it, uh, come into fruition, you know, which is now three years later and to, um, have it released, I mean, is really, it's really special, and I and I can't like be grateful enough uh, for my rhythm section bandmates, uh, for Dory Wallace on guitar, Miguel Ortiz on bass, and John Aparicio on the guitar, um, who's the nexus of the band, um, to to realize this with me and to work through the pandemic and to work week after week to to realize you know and actualize this dream, this longstanding dream. That I've had, you know, for since I was a teenager, playing music and being in a band, um, playing drums, and um, to have this, um, you know, what is physical, like in, in the CD form, even though you know many people don't listen to CDs anymore, but to be holding, you know, the the work in, in a tactile way, and this, this physical album with liner notes and, and this album cover and and looking at the back cover and then, and then all the, you know, looking at it online and, and what will be the digital release and, and uh, where it is on your rendered records website. I mean, I, I'm like, I can't be any more, um, grateful and excited and terrified and nervous and joy, you know, filled with joy. That, um, we completed this. I mean, it really, it really is, is awesome you know, to be, to be looking at it this way. So let's go back to that part of your life. You talked about being a teenager and wanting to have your own band. Let's go way back to the beginning. Tell me a little bit about how the seeds of not only music, but jazz got into you early influences and how this journey started to become who you are today. Yeah. Um, well, back, back when I was born, no, uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, the journey started in, 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 you know, 1977. I was born January 14th, 1977. And, um, I have a very early memory. You know, I grew up, um, I had an older sibling, my, my, my sister's two years older than me, um, was very into music. She was like a, a really huge fan of, of the band at the time it was called Duran Duran. Uh, there's even Duran Duran still around, but that, but she was a very big fan of, of, of that group. And this was, you know, like the mid, mid eighties. Um, and there was a show, we didn't have cable, um, but, but there was a show on regular TV called Video One with Richard Blade, where it was like a 30 minute show in my memory. And, and he would show music videos that were on MTV, but we didn't have MTV. So we would watch, you know, Richard Blade Video One. Um, and she was such a huge fan of of Duran Duran, a fan of this band, and you know, I looked up to her. You know, I really looked up to my sister. I thought she was cool, and and I wanted to connect with her, and and you know, this is something she was really excited about, and and so I would sit there and watch it with her. And I remember watching the videos, um, and and seeing the drummer, um, uh, from the band, and going, you know, having some kind of connection or like some thought that I want to do that. That's what I want to, you know, that looks cool. Um, my sister started taking guitar lessons and piano lessons. So when my mom asked me, 
you know, do you want to take piano lessons? Do you want? And I was like, no, I want, I want to play drums. And she, I have the memory I can see, like I'm at the steps in our living room, you know, responding to her. And she said, no, you're not going to play drums. You know, your grades, you need to do this. Like, you're going to take piano lessons. And I, I um, begrudgingly said, okay. Um, and then I, I think I took piano lessons for like, you know, a month or something. I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. Because I, I really... I, I I really had my heart and my mind, my body was set. I wanted to play drums. Um, and and her rejection for that was really, you know, stayed with me, clearly. And um, seven years later, you know, through throughout seven years of, from seven to 14, I, I really got into to music, you know, music that my sister was into, but also music that I was just into with my friends. Uh, the first album I ever bought was Run DMC's Raising Hell. It was a cassette tape. I still have the actual cassette tape. Um, and that was something me and my friends at, you know, 10 years old, 1987, um, were really into and gravitated around music. And it was, it was part, you know, it was the kind of popular, you know, coming into popularity uh, at the time. And uh, we really, like, you know, our social circle was all about you know, the Run the MC Raising Hell album, Beastie Boys, and, and and all the things around that that were coming out at the time. And that was really inspiring. And then and then um, starting to go to parties in middle school where, you know, a friend was a DJ and, and you know, uh, playing all sorts of different kinds of music, you know, De La Soul and, and you know, MC Hammer at the time. Um, and then I, you know, my sister was very much into, started getting into other bands like Guns N' Roses, uh, Led Zeppelin, and so so I started listening to that music too. So I was listening to all this mix of different things. Um, and at fourteen, like the freshman year, you know, uh, like between eighth grade and ninth grade, like thirteen, fourteen years old, someone in my neighborhood um, who I grew up around had a, had a drum set in the garage, and they were into into bands like TSOL, uh, the Dickies, like. Uh, like all these punk bands at the time and they had a, a punk rock garage band uh, and the drum set there and they would play and after they would rehearse or play and I would ask if I could play and, and, and get on the drums and I'd, sum, you know, a level of natural, you know, affinity uh, to it physically. Um, and my friend gave me a pair of drumsticks and I took it home and, and I, I set up, you know, my dad was a barber. He had these old barber stools in the backyard they wasn't using anymore. I said I brought that into my room um, and placed that in front of me like it was a snare drum, and I would air drum to uh, Guns N' Roses records, to James Addiction records, to, to Red Hot Chili Peppers, like all these bands that I, that I liked at the time. Uh, and, and that was my first kind of experience. And then finally, like around after my 14th birthday, they, my grandmother asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and I said I wanted a drum set. So seven years later, after that initial ask, I was granted, and then my mother and my grandmother put together and got, you know, my mother finally agreed, got me a drum set, got me my first drum set until freshman year of high school. Beautiful. What was the first live jazz show you ever saw that really blew you away? Yeah, the... This is another great memory for me that that I hold really special. Um, you know, the first concert I ever went to was was, uh, was the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, and Nirvana. Wow! It was a really great first concert to go to, and all that music oh was coming out. I, I don't think never. I think Nevermind had had wasn't even out yet, or was just out, or about to come out. Um, and um, I was like I mentioned before. I was in I was into James Addiction, and James and the drummer for James Addiction, Stephen Perkins, had a had an article, Modern Drummer, um, and he mentioned. Um, I'm giving you a really roundabout about the first you know show you asked me about, but oh, he, no, met, he he mentioned uh, Stephen Perkins mentioned like they would ask uh, what albums influenced um, him, and he mentioned uh, Rich versus Roach which was a, uh, uh, an album where Max Roach and Buddy Rich had like, like, like competition and, and songs by themselves and then songs where they were drumming together with, with their kind of big bands or kind of smallish big bands. And then he also mentioned uh, Benny Goodman. 
and and live at Carnegie Hall with Gene Krupa. And I was like, well, if he likes that stuff, I I need to see what that stuff is. And that that was my in to to that music because Buddy Rich and Max Roach they played with everybody. So then I would get everything they were on, and I would listen to Thelonious Monk, and I would listen to to Charlie Parker based on on them playing, you know, Max Roach and Buddy Rich playing with them, and I got really into that. So so two years later, like this is you know from 14 to 16, starting to listening to all that music, and and then some friends introducing some 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 of that music to me as well in high school and us getting into that together. I, I think looking at the LA Weekly and looking at like where this music was played and wanting to go see it live, like finding out where it was played. And there was a, a club here that's still around. It's not in the original location, but it's still here in Hollywood called Catalina Bar and Grill. So um, the first show that I went to there was uh, – uh, John Patitucci's band, and uh, and I I can picture it in my mind. It's Alex Acuna was on drums, uh, the great drummer who who I had heard and known from Weather Report, um, and then John Beasley on piano, who's who's still very active and awesome here in Los Angeles, and me and my friend uh, Paris, who was another drummer. Um, you know, at sixteen, I, I drove us there. We went there and. We're like, oh my god, this is amazing, and and wow, we're seeing like this this music live, and like not have ever seen seen people live at, at play at such a high level playing. You know, I'd seen I'd seen it on videos, you know, Buddy Rich like VHS videos or the Buddy Rich Big Band Scholarship concerts. You know, seeing these great drummers on VHS tapes, but but to see that live, I was I was like, this is like really you know, beyond. And I then became at 16 years old, a, a patron of going to Catalina Bar and Grill. I had a job at a, um, I was like working takeout at a, at a, an Italian restaurant and all my money would go, you know, to Catalina Bar and Grill. And right after the John Patitucci show, I, I think, you know, a week, two weeks later, I saw the Ray Brown trio with um, Jeff Hamilton and Benny Green and, was just like, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, to see to see that, you know, live. And I was like probably the youngest person in the place to my memory. Uh, you know, I got a fake ID so that I could drink, you know, when I was there. And <laughs> and um I was like this sixteen, right. seventeen, you know, eighteen year old like like going to this jazz club, like on school nights, you know, I would, I would go, you know, and hang out there and I would sit feet away from Dennis Chambers playing with Bob Berg. I I would like, you know, they would do sick night runs and I would be there every night, you know, at the table right next to the drums, uh, in awe and mesmerized and just, um, um, so happy to, to, to be able to witness this and, 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 and be in the room with all these people. See Jimmy Smith. I saw McCoy Tyner there. I saw so many, so many, um, great, great people to, to be able to see them live in that space. And, and Kelly used to be the small club on Cuenca. It's in a bigger place now, you know, some blocks away from the original spot. But in that time, in the, in the early mid nineties, it was in a small place. I, I mean, I saw these these legendary folks in there. And, and um, for me, it was a way to, to deal with what I was dealing with as a teenager, um, like whatever feelings I was having around, around, you know, wanting maybe a distraction or, or connection to something else um, outside of my, my family life or whatever insecurities I was going through. I, w- I would, you know, um, go to Catalina Bar and Grill and listen to this music and, and let it, you know, wash over me and and just be in awe and be so inspired um, to continue on, you know, and it was it was such a a major part of, of my later teenage years, you know, not going to see shows there. So speaking of live shows, what was the first stage that you got on that you were kind of blown away, like, wow, this is happening. I'm a professional <laughs> yeah. musician. Yeah. This is it. You know, I don't. You know, Joe, I don't know if I'd call myself a professional musician. Still, to this day, <laughs> to this day, <laughs> based on, you know, I would say, you know, I'm a middle school music teacher, and I'm a musician, you know, as well. 
Um, and, and I'm okay existing, you know, as, as that. Um, and at the same time, like being blown away on stage, like, I, you know, I, I had played my, uh, first show with, with my first band that I had in high school, uh, with my friend Errol Cooney, who's, who's a fantastic guitarist. Errol now plays, he's going on tour with Janet Jackson, uh, next month. He's played guitar for Stevie Wonder, you know, for years. Uh, and Errol and I had our first band together and, and, you know, we would sit in my room, write these songs and, and, and got a bass player and, and would, you know, different people like his brother sometimes play bass or other friends. And, and I would call it, you know, the clubs and try to put club shows. And at the time that there were the clubs, like we, all we knew was really the clubs on the Sunset Strip. So we, we played this place called, uh, the Coconut Teaser off of like Crescent Heights and, sunset and to me that was like oh my gosh we made it you know we're playing music in a, in a yeah. venue at a club and wow like wow, look at what we've done like i remember just being excited and and, and that to me the first one was um th that was it you know for me and and um and in my memory, we like opened up like the band on the bill with us was Incubus, who's, who's a you know really popular, successful uh, band now, and they were they were like another band from the valley, like we were. Um, and I still have when I'm on stage at these places, like I have the same same kind of feeling, same kind of thoughts, like oh my gosh, look what we look what we've done, look where we are, look where we're on here playing music, you know. Um, so from from then to now, it's it's every time is is this. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to be there and 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 can't believe that like I can get to continue you know I continue on and, and experience this long long standing kind of actualization of these thoughts and these dreams and and the way you know I've, I've, it's it's made me feel over the years you know. So the one thing about you, as we mentioned, being a professional musician, recording artist, you're a teacher, of all of these things that go into who you are, what truly motivates you? What is it that you look forward to the most every day in all of these capacities that are you? Oh, look forward to the most every day. Wow. I don't know. Some days I don't look forward to much. Some days I look forward to a lot. <laughs> Some days mm -hmm. I... I look forward to it to to very little uh and it depends on the circumstances around around what's going on in my life and and whatever celebrations and whatever challenges there may be um i I hope to um, you know I spend the majority of my time my time uh during the day uh at at the school that's where i where uh my work my work day is um and uh, my hope there is to be present and and I work to respond to the young people I'm working with in the most optimal way I can to to be able to provide them with the space um, to learn and to grow and and to also be who they are and to find out who they are uh, while at the same time you know trying to manage um, all the the challenges um, that that work comes with, and um, what I look forward to in that is is recently and coming back from the pandemic and being back on campus is um, to be able to to center myself and to be um, responsive to the environment and to respond in a way that that. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes as calm as it can be, um, and be a little bit, you know, hopefully less like reactive, you know, under under the the stress of, of what the work is of being a teacher, um, and to be compassionate with myself. You know, I look, I, I work to be compassionate with myself as well as, as compassionate uh, with the students I work with. So, I, I I look forward to that connection every day. You know. Um, you know, as challenging as it may be, uh, you know, that that's where I spend most of my days uh, during the school year. So nine months out of the year, you know, that's what I hope for on the daily and, and what I look forward to. 
So if we get off the phone, Jazz DeLorean pulls up. You can get in, punch in the digits, see a dream <laughs> show. Where are you going? Who are you going to see? A dream show? Who am I going to see? Oh, wow. There's, there's too many. <laughs> you know, uh, there's too many. However, his favorite musicians of all time who, who, I mean, I can, you know, I can go back. I could really go far back, right? I could go back to the 40s or... You know, to see, you know, Charlie Parker, to see, you know, go to the 60s, to see Miles Davis, Quintet, like those seminal groups, or to see the 70s, to see Mahavishnu, or, or Weather Report, or something. Um, however, if, if, if I'm, you know, thinking about the present day, you know, I don't want the DeLorean to even go that far. Uh, <laughs> I, I would, you know, I, I, my fa one of my favorite, uh, artists, uh, of all time is uh, uh, Henry Threadgill, who I, who I still have yet to see um, live. So I, I, w I would love to, to even go back like maybe a few months to try to see uh, Henry Threadgill's show and his band Zooid somewhere. I love his band Zooid so much and their music so much. So that, I mean, I, w I would, I, I still have yet. So whether it's DeLorean in the future, he's got a show coming up or a recent one, I would love to go see a Henry Threadgill show. Primarily, so very, uh, really, especially at the Village Vanguard. If I could see Henry Treadgill and do it at the Village Vanguard, that would be a, get me in, get me in the DeLorean for that. Oh man, where's Doc? Where's Doc? Where's Doc? Yeah, exactly. Where yeah. is Doc? Because I'll go there too. Yeah, I had a dream some months back about being in the Village Vanguard, and uh, my wife always gives me a hard time about getting the T-shirt at shows, and I just never do. You know, I'll get it for the kids or somebody yeah, else yeah. can get it, but I, I'm just like, I'm, I'm good. Is there too much? Whatever. But I remember in the dream specifically, she was like, if you don't get a Village Vanguard shirt, there's going to be some problems when you get out of here. <laughs> and I remember I got the shirt, but just <laughs> yeah, yeah. feeling what that was like, you know, it, yeah, that would be absolutely amazing. So I'm curious, very simply put, why do you love jazz? I uh, you know I uh music because it's helped me. Um it's helped me through my life, you know, it, it it's helped me connect, feel connected to other people, feel connected to the experience of of what I think living is. Uh it's it's brought me close to people. Um it's inspired me. Um it's been a medicine for loneliness throughout my life. Um, it, it's been a way to push me along, you know, whether it's, it's, um, what has given me a career in teaching, which has, you know, set me up for my adult life, you know, is very much my job is around music. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, helped me like get in touch with myself. It's helped me to, to feel connected to myself and to others, and it's inspiring. You know, this music uh, was born in spite of, of terrible circumstances in the, in the history of the United States. Um, and in spite of that history, this, this music uh, came out of, of dire situations. So... Um, I, I, you know, can't think of something, you know, to be, to look at, to, to find some inspiration in, in what it is to, um, triumph over, over adverse circumstance, um, in some respect. So, um, all those things I mentioned and more, I mean, it's hard to put into words, but, you know, that's, that's as, I think as best as I can put it right now. Man, that was well, well said. So everyone out there has an idea or perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your students, but ultimately you're in control. You live your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Uh, I am, oh, I am a, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a human. I'm a, I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a friend, I'm a foe to some, I'm a drummer, I'm still a student, I am a teacher, uh, I'm a musician, I'm a band leader, and 
I'm someone who's who's still becoming and and, and trying continue to try to be um, the best that I can be in each moment. So my perception of myself is someone who 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 continues to grow, who tries to to continue to get better and work with with the the things in my life to to keep trying to find some sense of either moving forward or get more connected with um, myself and, and, and to stay uh, inspired to, to, to keep moving on day to day. That right there is all encompassing. Dean, this has been wonderful, man. Thank you for opening up, being so revealing to talk about the new material. I can't wait to profile it on the show and get the interview out there. And thanks for the kind yeah. words about the show. It's great to me. You know, I didn't. I didn't mention enough. I don't know if if, if it's still part of the show, but but um, to mention, you know, I mentioned my rhythm section bandmates, but you know, Alex Williams on piano and Brian Hargrove on keyboards are really the featured um, artists, you know, or the featured musicians on this album. It's a drummer. You know, I'm a I'm a drummer, a band leader. I'm a, it's a drummer led album. However, um, it re- you know, it really is a piano and keyboard al- album. And Alex Williams and Brian Hargrove came in, uh, you know, to work with with the band for this album. And I just, you know, made some astonishingly incredible music um, w- with what we were doing. And, and really uh, to hear them play and improvise and be spontaneous on this album, I just want to highlight uh, Alex Williams and Brian Hargrove's contribution to the music is, is really, really, really stellar and beyond what I could have imagined. So just to, just to add that somewhere. I'm glad you did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is a wonderful album, and, and I can attest to that as well. It's very driven by, uh, by that vibe. And um, I, uh, yeah, again, I, I'm really looking forward to profiling it on the show. So thank you for opening up. Thank you for giving me all of the goods about your music world and uh, it, again it's great to meet you and best of luck with everything thank you appreciate it thanks Joe so much thanks for talking to me and thanks for having me it really really is awesome to talk to you thank you thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Los Angeles Kansas City and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and profound thanks to Dean for reaching out to the show being such a fan and giving us his very flavor rich story if you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts subscribe to us at YouTube and for everything Neon Jazz all the time go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com until next time Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.